This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Georgia Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Hi there, pull up a chair, a sofa, even a futon will do. We just want you to be comfortable as you take in all the latest ag news and features. Yeah, but just don't fall asleep because that would hurt our feelings. Nonetheless, here's what's coming up. As the city of Atlanta prepares to host this year's Super Bowl, Southernville Farm gets an early start to the festivities. Owner Jake Carter on how the coveted Vince Lombardi trophy ended up in his peach orchard. Also on the program, a Georgia cotton producer shares all as the industry braces itself for the uncertain fallout following the retaliatory tariffs imposed by China. Plus, the Fire Monitor drone makes its way to Cleveland, Georgia, and a story on Allison's Raw Honey and Vineyard. There's quite a buzz regarding their expansion project, and you are going to hear all about it. These stories and so much more starting right now on the Fire Monitor. With summer winding down, there's still plenty of hot weather in the days and weeks to come. That means it's more important than ever for producers to carefully manage cattle in order to avoid heat stress. Damon Jones spoke with some industry experts and has some tips and ideas to make sure your herd stays healthy and safe. Summers in the south bring with it plenty of heat. That makes things a little uncomfortable for anyone or anything outside, including animals. It's especially concerned for cattlemen as cows are unable to naturally cool their bodies. If we think about the physiology, they, they, can't, they don't sweat. So the basic way they get rid of heat is through respiration and getting to a place that's cooler. Uh, so what happens is they have a heat load uh, and they accumulate heat over the day. So they need a time where they can dissipate that heat. That usually takes a couple of hours after the hottest part of the day which means there is a best time to work the herd. Typically we say early in the, in the, earlier in the day is better when it's, when it's not hot, uh, but we also say avoid the evening. So, so unlike us, we don't work in the, in the evenings because kind of going back to talking about how those animals uh, function, they need that evening time to dissipate that heat. And cattlemen across the state take this advice to heart as they get an early start and even make some modifications to their operation in order to make the animals more comfortable. Well, during the summertime, especially if, if I've got to work cattle, I work them very early in the morning and get it done before the heat of the day. You can, you can usually do this by 10 o'clock. And uh, improvements I've made, I've, I've got a self-waterer in my catch lot. And so all the time I'm working them, they can get uh, fresh water. I've got a a Richie, there are other brands out there just as good, but that works for me. And it certainly works for the cows as well, as this is one of the main comforts these animals need during the hot summer. Shade uh, and water, uh, a good source of clean, fresh water helps them throughout the day, uh, maintain, their, the, their, uh, maintain their temperature. But also for working those animals, uh, we want to do have shade available for those animals and also watch those animals. Uh, they'll tell you if they're getting too hot. If we see that respiration rate go up, uh, tongue out, uh, saliva, uh, then we know that they're, they're getting too hot and we need to back off what we're doing with them. Keeping the animals well-groomed is also important as the longer the hair, the more heat that can get trapped in. There used to be a line running from east to west that they didn't feed Brahma cross cattle above that line and uh, they didn't feed the English cattle below that line. And it's because of the heat and what the hair does to them. It's just, just like you and I. The more clothes we got on the summer, the hotter you get. Speaking of hotter, cattle that are kept in barns or feedlots should be watched over even more carefully as they are more likely to be affected by the heat. If we're in a barn, we're typically thinking about animals on full feed or feedlot type rations. And those, we call them hot rations because they produce more heat through the fermentation of the rumen. So those animals that are under a barn or in a feedlot situation may actually accumulate heat faster. So we do need to handle those a little differently. Be a little more cautious of how we handle them to avoid the heat stress. Reporting from Athens, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. Damon, thank you so much. So in the meantime, you'd be smiling too if you got to do what Southern Bell farm owner Jake Carter did recently. As you may already know, Atlanta is the site of this year's Super Bowl. Well, Jake was out on the field one day when he got a call from CBS asking him 
if they could use Southern Bell as a backdrop for the Super Bowl trophy. Naturally, Jake said, absolutely. We talked through it a little bit, and, you know, they're wanting a shot of, um, you know, Georgia and the Americana, uh, the feel of the South. And, um, you know, we certainly welcome with open arms to come down to the farm and uh, get a shot of the old truck that we have and do some shots around the peach orchard. And um, it was just a really neat experience. They were protecting that thing like a newborn baby. I'll tell you what, it was in a, in a special case. Uh, my two nephews actually got to hold it, but they had to put on all this protective gear. Uh, to actually touch the Lombardi Trophy. Um, they say if you touch the trophy with bare hands, they have to send it back to Tiffany and Company and have it rebuffed. Um, so, you know, we were certainly um, on edge just having it here on the farm. We didn't want it to uh, take a spill at Southern Bell, but uh, what a neat experience just to get to see the trophy up close. Meantime, you've seen it in the headlines for weeks now, Chinese tariffs on ag products. But how are they affecting farmers? The Monitor's John Holcomb recently talked with a cotton producer down in Vianna to see how the tariffs have affected the Georgia cotton industry. This is Matt Coley. Matt is a cotton farmer himself and also runs Coley Gin down in Vianna. I paid him a visit to talk with him about the new tariffs on U.S. cotton being exported to China to see what impacts he and his family's operation has felt. He informed me that right now, things are still business as usual. It's hard to have a you know a finite number on what kind of impact it's had. You know we've we've uh, we've we've seen the futures market drop some as it as it appears as these tariffs have gotten into place and uh, it seems like the uh, the talks aren't going quite as well as they were earlier. But at the same point, we've had some had some pretty bullish factors uh, uh, bring that market back up. So. So right now, um, you know, grower at this point in time, growers are still able to tie in a historically high price uh, for the 2018 uh, crop year. That does, however, leave open the question of what happens to the crop that will be harvested this year. This time of the year, we're, we're in between old crop and new crop. So it, it, you know, I think as we get into the fall and, and you know, maybe we'll start seeing more of the full effect if these tariffs are still in place. While they're concerned for one of their biggest markets, Growers are still optimistic that there will be other buyers out there that are willing to buy their product. China is 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 a major destination for for U.S. cotton, um, but you know we're fortunate to have a lot of other buyers out there in the world too. Um, so I you know I think cotton cotton has seen uh, the demand for cotton has has been inching up the last couple of years. So um, you know we're cotton growers in the U.S. and across the world we're producing a product that. Uh, that consumers won't. With that being said though, in the long run, it's up to the consumers on how the market does as the trade war drags out, since the consumer ultimately controls the demand. If the trade war is drawn out and, you know, the, the, the cost to, to the um, importers of cotton continues to rise, I mean, ultimately that's going to fall on the consumer. And, um, you know, that anytime you, you see, um, uh, the cost of the consumer goes up, there's the potential for, for some of that demand for cotton to pull back, and that's, uh, that's certainly something we, so, something we don't want to see. But what if we do see a drop in demand for cotton? Well, simple economics suggests that the price of growers get for the cotton will drop. However, if growers start to lose money, there is some good news. The USDA announced that it will be assisting farmers hurt by the tariffs. And as for Coley, he distrusts that the administration will get this trade war settled and make it fair for both sides. Growers in America, we produce the safest, most affordable, most abundant supply of food and fiber in, in the world. And the world needs us. And, you know, so it's, it's important that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that, you know, as we enter in these trade agreements, they're, they're fair. They're, they're fair for both sides. And, and I think this administration, is that's what they're, they're working towards. Reporting in Vienna for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. Up next, Allison's Raw Honey and Vineyard. Let's just say the sky's the limit for this popular North Georgia business. After the break, the Monitor talks to owner Lloyd Allison about his plans for major expansion. Hi, I'm Brittany Braddy, and I'm from the Montgomery County High School FFA chapter. This year I will be serving as one of the 2018-2019 Central Region State Vice Presidents. It means to me 
that I have accomplished something not through my work but through the works of others and that it shows through the influence of my agriculture education teacher Jonathan Hardeman through the influence of my parents and my grandparents and my sister that's something that we've all put forth the effort to really show our passion for agriculture and our passion for service and to be able to serve those other FFA members it's a feeling that I can almost not describe because of how impactful and how great it is. To learn more about the National FFA organization, log on to FFA.org. And that's what I love about the job is just learning uh, so much. And that's where I learn by, from our trainings and from experience. And then I can actually apply that by teaching uh, others in the in the county, farmers and homeowners. I guess that's when it gets all down to it. That's the main reason I came back to Extension was because I like to help people, and I saw where I could, you know, I can help these people. And then even beyond there is is more of you. It's got to be more of just helping people. It's got to be you care about the people, and that's where I feel like in my county I care about the people, and I really want to help them because of my caring for them. So that's. That's why, that's the reason I love the job. High above in the mountains of North Georgia sits Allison's Raw Honey, located just a few miles from downtown Cleveland. It's a favorite of locals and it's been successful for over three decades now. At the front of the property sits a small building, as well as an invitation welcoming all who come. Once inside, there's a variety of honey and a money box for the good old fashioned honor system. But a few years ago, owner Lloyd Allison, a first generation beekeeper, decided to cash in on his sweet success and expand the farm to include muscadines, wines, blueberries, and other fruits, as well as jams and jellies. For Lloyd, the need to diversify really wasn't a need at all. No, for Lloyd, it was a dream coming to fruition. I think on the wall in, in my bedroom, I, in a magic marker, I, I wrote, I want to be a, a dairy farmer when I was six years old. So that was my first thoughts. I, you know, a farmer, uh, only a farmer knows the connection to the earth, and, uh, and I've got that connection. I love to see things grow. I love to see production, and it's not, it's not the money, uh, but it's, it's just seeing things grow. And being successful, of course, you, you got to be successful in farming. Today, we, um, you know, 35, 40 years later, we, we're running approximately 1,000 colonies of bees. Um, we have bees in three, three counties in jo uh, Georgia, uh, in North Georgia. We have uh, Union, White, and Towns County. And then we have bees in South Georgia and Dooley. County down in down in middle Georgia we we make cotton honey down there but uh, that's basically how we got started uh, uh, in, in beekeeping my grandfather uh, purchased this purchased this property in the 1940s early 1940s and originally it was about 600 acres here on this farm with uh, with a river the Tessany River running through the, the middle and it was a uh, 90 95 percent woods at that time and so I had a 600 acre playground out here with a, with a river running through the middle for a swimming hole. And I had two brothers and um, a few years ago, my, my dad passed and uh, we, we got, you know, the divisions in the property here. So I, I could really start doing um, some work here. And so I, I decided to plant a vineyard here. Um, this, this field here is uh, approximately five acres of uh, muscadine grapes, uh, about 50% bronze and 50% 50, 50 black muscadines. On, on back, we have approximately five or six more acres, so I'll have 25 acres or so of muscadines when, when, I, when I finish. And uh, this, this venture came kind of kind of later in, in life, I uh, turned turned 61 and um, decided if I was going to do this, I'd better get on with it. So in the next three or four years, I hope to have uh, all 
all the 25 acres in muscadines and I also have uh, four acres of apples, um, three acres of blueberries, and a uh, um, portion of an acre of uh, peaches. We picked the fruit yesterday, and uh, as, as you saw, the ladies are down there making, making jam and jelly today. So I think it's the, the freshness of the, of the fruit. Uh, uh, it makes a better, a better product and uh, you know it's just another way to diversify the, the fruit. The bees are a roller coaster ride you know they're, they're up and down uh, you know you, you lose you, bee, bee decline, bees decline because of the mites and one thing and another and um, I just wanted to diversify a little bit uh, in case we had a, a bad year uh, in the honey production maybe we'd have a bumper crop in the grapes and then, you know, getting into the wine and uh, jellies and jams and uh, you pick and, you know, all the above, you know, and uh, just uh, kind of thought it would be a fun thing to do. And uh, maybe one day I'll sit back and look at this and let other people take it over and, and I'll travel. Sounds like a plan to me. Well, when we come back, Charles Denny checks in with a really neat story on how turf grass specialists here in the U.S. played a major part in this year's World Cup in Russia. A new variety of agritourism is sprouting in Virginia. Instead of just visiting a pick-your-own farm for a part of a day, consumers can experience the full range of raising their own food. Just as urban residents connect at farmer's markets, working at a farm can expand a consumer's connection to agriculture. Northern Neck farmers Lawrence and Cameron Latney are inviting volunteers to do just that. Yeah, so basically we uh, kind of had all that rain about 10 days ago, maybe two weeks ago, and we had all these weeds because, you know, being organic, we have to pull them by hand, so it's a lot of work and quickly get overwhelmed by that. So we were like, what can we do? And they were like, well, we've kind of been thinking about doing volunteer days. And I was like, well, let's get some volunteers. And I don't know, it was, was kind of all of us kind of came up with it, but um, We'll get people out, do like a fish fry, have a good time, do a little bit of work, and it just kind of went from there. And Courtney put a message up on Facebook, and it slowly started to gain interest. The Latney's farm, Blenheim Organic Gardens, is located just a mile from George Washington's birthplace and the Potomac River. Courtney Fishback works with the Latneys and uses social media to coordinate volunteer activities with members of the Blenheim Farm's community-supported agriculture group. A lot of people I feel like are drawn to that now is just to be outside more and because everybody's always cooped up and like all like squashed together and you get to enjoy, you get to hear the bird songs, you get to see the eagles like we uh, Westmoreland has such a big bald eagle like like so many bald eagles and so you get to listen to their calls and um, and then people get, yeah, and then people get to, we could converse. We have our own like little podcast. Like we sit there and just talk about what's going on, you know, and you just sit there and just pull weeds. The volunteer program at the farm is just one way consumers can immerse themselves in agriculture. Other farms in the Old Dominion offer weekend getaways or longer, where visitors perform farm chores like feeding livestock, milking goats, riding horses, harvesting eggs, and picking fresh fruit and vegetables. The Latneys were confident that their customers would want to make the trip from Fredericksburg to get their hands dirty. Well, it's been a, um, an idea that uh, my son Cameron and a, and a few of his friends that work here have been talking about. And uh, it's an uh, opportunity to have fun on the farm at the same time that we sort of uh, uh, host people that are looking for a farm experience or looking for a, just to get away. We haven't done, this is sort of the first of that thing we've done, but we've had any number of people on the farm through the wolfing uh, group and that sort of uh, thing that have come out just to sample what a farm experience is like. 
Working on the farm, away from cell phones and constant interruptions, can have a real therapeutic effect on people. Fresh air, being close to nature, and helping crops thrive are a common experience for everyone who works with the land, farmer and consumer alike. I've never been here. I've been buying from this farm for about five or six years, so this is the first time I visited this farm, so in a volunteer capacity, so I like it. This is the third time I'm here, and it's very meditative. Uh, the last time I was out here, I actually weeded four hours by myself, and it was just very nice to just kind of not think about anything and just pull weeds. This day's activities at Blenheim Organic Gardens created both sweat and smiles as the work went on, weeding tomatoes and planting sunflower seedlings. The event became known as the Weeding Party, with the promise of an evening fish fry to follow. After all, it's really about getting people out to the farm to enrich lives and see something compelling and new. In Westmoreland County, this is Dave Miller. Finally this week, they may be rivals when it comes to sporting events, but one thing about UGA and Tennessee, they do share common ground, so to speak, and are experts and well-respected in the turf grass industry. In fact, researchers at UT played a significant role in the world's biggest sporting event recently. Turf grass experts consulted on the playing fields for the World Cup soccer matches over in Russia. Charles Denny tells us about the work to make fields safer. The turf grass program at UT's Institute of Agriculture delivers quite a kick these days. It had a hand, or more specifically a foot, in the biggest event in sports. Yeah, we, we think the Super Bowl's big, but you know, you know, half the world's population watches World Cup soccer. There you go. The World Cup in Knoxville? Well, these aren't pro soccer players, rather faculty and students, gathered this day to kick the old ball around and to celebrate a notable achievement. The turf you see here at the UT Ag Research Center is the same turf you saw in the Russian stadiums, like this game between Spain and Morocco. The Institute's soccer enthusiasts got to experience the high-end surface under their own feet. Here was the goal. UTIA's Center for Athletic Field Safety consulted the company that managed several of the stadium fields for the World Cup. And this study in particular is a hybrid system called Sisgrass and we're testing this product for the company which actually has six of the World Cup stadiums in Russia you know a game being played as we're speaking right now on on this exact kind of surface it's a sand based reinforced fiber with uh, bluegrass as Americans, we may not truly get the magnitude of the World Cup, but when the games were played in 2014, more than three billion people watched the matches. Surely this year, a few might notice the playing surfaces. Tom Gill hopes so. When he's not playing goalie, he's director of UTIA's international programs. It's a great opportunity for everyone at the Institute, and everyone here in Knoxville to learn right about something in our own backyard that's being used all around the world right now and especially in this big sporting event so FIFA World Cup. Herbert College of Ag grad student John Thomas helped on this project. He also got an international experience studying turf spending several months interning for a soccer team in London. Great experience to have a world-class facility um, and they taught me a lot about uh, stuff being on the the front end of renovations uh, and how they control different weeds. After their pickup game, the group gathers at a Knoxville restaurant to watch the World Cup, admiring the action and the field. Meantime, back at the Ag Research Center, work goes on to build safer, more consistent, and playable surfaces. Getting your kicks for science. World-class turf. This is Charles Denny reporting. All right, that's going to do it for this week's edition of the Farm Monitor. Here's a reminder for all the latest Ag Info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening down on the farm. Be sure and check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of Farming Plus with us here on the show. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week right here on the Farm Monitor. As always, have a great week.